Hi, I'm Jim Pethokoukas, and welcome to today's AEI event, Is the Great Stagnation Over? Since the early 1970s, Americans have seen disappointing levels of economic growth, productivity growth, and apparently technological progress, at least compared to the immediate post-war decades. However, there seem to be new reasons for optimism. As the COVID-19 pandemic begins to recede, short-term economic projections are extremely optimistic. And 2020 was an impressive year for technological progress, featuring rapid vaccine innovation, the use of AI for discovering new antibiotics, positive developments regarding nuclear fusion, and a new age of human spaceflight for the United States. The media are also starting to catch on. A few recent headlines. The New York Times, the coming technology boom. From Bloomberg, the 1920s roared after a pandemic and the 2020s will try. From The Economist, why a dawn of technological optimism is breaking. And from the Financial Times, goodbye virus ridden 2020, hello roaring 20s. Uh, so is the great stagnation really over? And if so, what does that mean? To try and answer these questions, I'll be chatting with a really great panel. Tyler Cowan is the Hol Holbert L. Harris Chair of Economics at George Mason University. And he serves as Chairman and Faculty Director of the Mercatus Center. He's the author of several books, including 2011's the Great Stagnation. Catherine Tucker is the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management Science and Professor of Marketing at MIT's Sloan School of Management. She's also the co-founder of the MIT Crypto Economics Lab and co-organizer of the Economics of Artificial Intelligence Initiative. Dietrich Volrath is a Professor of Economics and Chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Houston. He's also the author of Fully Grown, Why a Stagnant Economy is a Sign of Success, released last April. And finally, Michael Strain is the Director of Economic Policy Studies here at AEI, as well as the Arthur F. Burns Scholar in Political Economy, and he's the author of The American Dream is Not Dead, but Populism Could Kill It, released last year. Uh, one thing, finally, before we begin, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of this event, so please, please submit your questions as soon as possible on Twitter with the hashtag AskAEIEcon. That's Ask AEI Econ. You can also submit a question via email by contacting the email address listed in the event description. So uh, to begin, I'm going to start with uh, Tyler, uh, since you wrote a book called The Great Stagnation, and it's a big reason why I'm probably doing this panel. It's been 10 years since you published that book. What was your argument at the time about the great stagnation and why we were stagnating? At the time, I suggested that our previous technologies had in some regards run their course. So if you take powerful machines and fossil fuels and put them together as a kind of general purpose technology, we did everything we could with that. So we invented cars, then everyone, almost everyone had a car and then cars got better. But along some margins, cars just didn't get all that much better. I think the odds are we are today on the cusp of another revolution based on new general purpose technologies, which I would define as some mix of internet computers and computational power. So uh, in 2011, when I published the book, I thought the great stagnation would end within the next 20 years. And odds are that's what we're seeing today is the great stagnation ending. Um, and this is for anyone who wants to jump in. Is there a general consensus? For what period are we talking about? Are we talking since the early 70s? Uh, are we talking really since the end of the internet boom? Uh, first of all, when we talk about a stagnation, are both those applicable? And do we have a good reason why they happened to begin with? Uh, Tyler gave one set of reasons. Is that the general consensus? Well, can I, can I just key off uh, uh, Tyler's comment about about sure. the, um, the, the the time period we have to look forward to. I uh, am very confident in uh, my view that, that the great stagnation such as it, it was is not permanent. Uh, there is a whole lot of uh, innovation happening, um, new technologies being created. Um, and uh, it's true that we haven't found the best uses for all of those new technologies uh, and, and all of those new um, new inventions. But I'm very confident that at some point we will. Um, so uh, that, that's what I mean. When I say I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't think I don't think stagnation uh, is is a permanent condition. Uh, but whether or not uh, we figure out how to use all this great new innovation in the next three years, five years, 10 years, 
you know, there I'm feeling um, uh, less confident about, about any any prediction um, that that I might make. And so I think, I think Tyler actually framed it well. You know, at some point in the next 20 years, this is going to end. We're about halfway through that period. I I, I guess I would agree with that. You know, I'd be I'd be surprised if we woke up in the year 2031 and hadn't figured out how to use a lot of this new technology. And in fact, we just saw a great use of of, of new uh, uh, some new technology in the creation of the coronavirus uh, vaccines, um, and that'll have a huge impact on productivity. Uh, but whether or not this happens in 2023 or 2025 or 2027, I think I think when you start getting to that level of granularity, it becomes harder and harder to make predictions. Um, is the reason for this, and I asked this to, to Catherine, um, is the reason for this confidence, do you think, mostly because that's kind of how it's always worked before? We've come up with great new ideas, took a little while to figure out how to use them, how to spread them throughout the economy. Eventually, they made big differences. Are we just kind of assuming that these new technologies are just kind of like the ones in the past and will have that eventual impact, whether it's next year or, or 10 years from now? <laughs> No, this is such a wonderful question. So I'm something I'm something which is called a digital economist. And we've spent the last 20 to 25 years trying to excuse why it is that all the technologies we studied have been everywhere apart from the productivity fit figures. And we've got two major explanations. One is that we're just not measuring it right. Google Maps appear nowhere in the productivity figures. Google Maps are just wonderful, right? And we're just missing out on these innovations. And then if people aren't convinced by that argument, we then say, but look at electricity, look at steam. It's just natural that for a true general purpose technology, you expect 20 to 30 years of really what we're gonna call constant experimentation before it appears in the productivity figures. So I think that aligns with a lot of what the panel is saying. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I think Catherine really hit that correctly in the sense that I think you look historically, most of these big events, if you think of these central general purpose technologies, we think of them as arising immediately. And, and the, the moment electricity came around, everything changed. But that was a decades long uh, event. I mean, to the point that, you know, I mean, we were electrifying uh, rural America into the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s. This is, these are decade long changes. So um, the, the fact that that we haven't seen massive productivity growth out of, of computing, say, or the internet doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't come. And, and as Tyler was mentioning, it may just be that we're finally to the point where it really, where we really figured out how to use it, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, we've just been experimenting. Yes, I mean, the way I always, which I've always liked as a technology economist to think about it is we thought that the light bulb, we thought that electricity was initially about the light bulb and about illumination. And the productivity impact of that wasn't amazing. On the other hand, putting electricity into factories, that is a real productivity revolution. So I think so much, you know, of, you know, what you're calling the experimentation period, we don't even for 20 years, maybe we've just been using technologies for things which aren't showing up in the productivity figures. And Jim, to answer your question more directly, um, uh, I agree with all that. You know, my 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 optimism is not driven by, you know, some sort of kind of vague, you know, this is how it's always happened in the past. I mean, if you look at specific technologies, you know, we're we're getting much better at batteries, we're getting much better at 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 at, uh, at therapies like vaccines, um, we're getting uh, much better at artificial intelligence. Um, you can go onto YouTube and find videos of driverless trucks going going down the highway. You know, so these are these are very you know specific, concrete, tangible innovations and and and, and technologies that that you can point to. And the question is, you know, at some point, um, our business is going to figure out how to how to make how to make money using them. And the 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 motivation there, I think, is so strong that the answer is is surely yes. I think the new innovations will be special in at least one significant way. A lot of them will not contribute that much to per capita GDP. So if you take the mRNA vaccines, which we know work, right? I've had two of them. They're influencing what would normally be called the cyclical component. 
if you think of older people as more likely to die from COVID-19 uh, by saving lives, I'm not suggesting per capita GDP will go down, but the impact on human welfare will be much greater than what would appear to be the long-term secular trend in GDP. Uh, also, two of the big advances that might happen is a vaccine against HIV AIDS and an effective vaccine against malaria. Those would be incredible advances for humanity. I don't know how much they would show up in US per capita GDP or productivity, possibly not really much at all. The other new wave of innovations, which you could call green energy, again, you could be very optimistic about those, but the main thing they're doing is helping us avoid a catastrophe. So they're boosting GDP relative to a quite awful counterfactual of just continuing to burn coal and other fossil fuels. Uh, I'm not sure we'll feel we have higher standards of living relative to what we were used to simply because there's a solar panel on your home. It might in some ways make your energy supply better, but again, it will be hidden by the counterfactual. So it will be a very strange kind of technology boom when I look at the two main areas where I see a lot of progress. So Jim, can I disagree with, with Tyler a little bit? Um, right. I want to agree and disagree. I, I, th I think Tyler, it goes back to the issue of, of, of the time scale you're talking about. And so I, I agree with you that if, you know, we can, you know, go into the lab and create a malaria vaccine and it takes two weeks to do that, um, uh, you know, that, that would be a game changer for human welfare. I wouldn't expect to show up in, in U.S. productivity statistics the year after or the year after that. But um, a world where we, we aren't losing so much uh, talent and skill um, to malaria uh, will look a lot different than, than, than the status quo. And you know, maybe 10 years from now, there's, there's uh, a renaissance in Africa of invention. You know, some, there's a Bill Gates uh, who, a figure who pops up who would have died of malaria, but who didn't. Um, and, uh, and, and then we can all benefit from, benefit from that. And so my, my, you know, my, my view is that over, over a suitably long time horizon, uh, that malaria vaccine would show up in, in, in U.S. Uh, productivity statistics, but, but over, or over a suitably short time horizon, it wouldn't. I see that as very long run, though. The countries that will benefit the most from such a vaccine are not really producing ideas or TFP today. So they might send more talented migrants to the United States, but there's a legal cap on migration and those people might come from some other region instead. I see it as a 40, 50 year effect on any US statistic. Again, I'm delighted about it for the sake of those lives, those countries, GDPs elsewhere. But in terms of US statistics, I think things could be incredible. And for the next 10 years, it's gonna look like the boring 2.2% story or something else that will be quite unexceptional. Yeah, I think we need to be conscious of the difference between technological optimism and technological uh, advances in, a, in an exciting decade, say, of, of, of innovation, that that's distinct from how we measure boring old GDP and productivity, because they just they separate more and more over time. I think, you know, if we go back 80 years, GDP and innovation probably were really much more tightly linked because innovations were, were producing things that generated demand for themselves. You invent the refrigerator and everybody goes through a wave of buying a refrigerator and it, it, it plays right into um, productivity statistics and GDP. But a lot of innovations today are, are you know, Tyler brought this up about some of the say climate-based ones. They're, they're really about replacing, they're about not buying certain things. They're, they're not about creating a market or adding a product. They're about replacing one or removing one. So it, it, I just think the disconnect can be there and, and which isn't to say we should be pessimistic, but, but we, we need to maybe not have our optimism keyed off of measured productivity and measured GDP statistics necessarily. Is there a risk that if we go through a period where none of this stuff is really showing up in, in, in data. And maybe, maybe it's not obvious that people's living standards are rising. Do we risk having sort of less societal tolerance for the kinds of disruptions that economic growth and progress uh, naturally make? And we had this whole populist movement maybe gets worse and there's less tolerance for 
for job loss or job dislocation or any other disruptions that come? I mean, don't there don't we need to have a tangible signs of rising living standards to, to justify policies that promote you know, growth and progress? I'll, uh, I, I think those innovations will be the, will be tangible, right? Like uh, a malaria vaccine is incredibly tangible to people who you know live in an environment where that's endemic. The uh, the advances in 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 AI and computing, or just being able to do a panel like this that we've you know we've kind of all adapted into this this system. These these are tangible things people can note. And but uh, but I think there is a good question there. Is like it. Will people accept that even knowing when they look at the statistics, they're like, well, it doesn't look like anything's changing. But in many ways, right, like we all felt changes even over this stagnant last couple of decades, right? We live fundamentally different lives than, uh, than we did when, you know, in, when I was growing up or, you know, my parents live fundamentally different lives now than they did in the past, even without massive productivity growth. I don't think anybody's looking at the GDP or productivity statistics, um, but they are, I think, looking at, you know, in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, assessing how they, how they feel about kind of broader economic policy issues. But they are, they are thinking about their, their own lives. And I really wonder if the pandemic is going gonna, is gonna to affect that. I mean, you know, I think, I think you know, Tyler, when, when your book came out, that was really kind of in some ways at the beginning of this, this populist wave um, or certainly in the early stages of it. Uh, and you know, what I argue against um, the, the narrative of, of, of populism, you know, I'll, you know, I get a lot of, you know, sarcastic comments about, oh, great, you know, you have a better iPhone than you used to have, but, you know, what does that actually, you know, what does that actually, actually do? Or, you know, Facebook is better than it was or things of that nature. Um, but we did, you know, we just, we just defeated the plague in a year. Um, and that was technology, and that was the big bad pharmaceutical companies um, uh, that did that. And you know, I think it's still too early to to, to say. But I wonder if um, if there won't be uh, more warmth toward um, you know kind of abstract notions of creative destruction and abstract notions of the importance of innovation um, as a consequence of what I think is you know, reasonably widely viewed as, as a pretty stunning uh, technological success in terms of the vaccine. Here's one of my fears. It's that biomedical innovation progresses so fast and the rest of the economy stays relatively static. So we become older as a society more quickly than we had been expecting. May or may not be populism, but you could have a lot more status quo bias, just more entrenchment, Tenure is more of a problem, and we could, in a funny way, innovate ourselves into a tighter complacency and a tighter stagnation. I'm not rooting against increases in life expectancy. Sater is paribus. I, I would take them, obviously. Uh, but that said, you want to be careful about the order in which progress comes, and I'm not sure we're going to get it in an optimal order. I worry about that also with, with inequality, where you have a situation where you know, if you're, you know, some new cancer therapy is invented and you can, you can avoid chemotherapy um, uh, and, you know, it basically cures your cancer with, with, with hundred percent probability, hundred percent success rate, but it's extremely expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, so we now have a situation where, you know, not, not only do the rich, you know, find it easier to send their kids to college, but they also um, don't die from cancer, whereas the lower middle class still does die from cancer. Something, something of that nature. I think, I think that's a real, that's a real risk um, uh, as well. All right. I'll just sort of jump in there and say that you know, in the the digital economic space, we have a lot of studies trying to say, well, do digital technologies enhance? Or you get rid of and get rid of inequality, or are they making it worse? And I think the annoying, annoying a result for ever having a general thesis is we have many contradictory results. I mean, you've got your very appealing cancer example here, but there's also papers which show that simple processes such as digitizing medical records actually enhance outcomes for poorer patients because the doctors aren't having to listen anymore and paying potentially more attention to someone who's high, more highly educated. Instead, it's um, something which helps actually outcomes 
for people who might not get the right medical attention. So I'm just saying, I think there's the, you can, for every bad implication you have for reinforcing inequality, I also think you can find some rays of hope as well. It's, it, to just follow up on what Catherine said, it certainly seems to me that a lot, a lot of the media coverage, at least uh, about digital technologies, is about, is about the downsides, is about inequality, it's about a surveillance state, uh, it's about job loss. You know, the robots take all the uh, all the jobs. Catherine, do you, I wonder if Catherine senses that as well, and if that's at all uh, worrisome. I do worry about a lot of sort of pushback against uh, against these technologies. I don't know a neo luddite movement or something where people just don't see the the upside to all this change. Well, you know, a year ago, I think before the pandemic hit, and people were were thinking about worthier topics. In my field, this phrase tech lash became popular, which is just this idea of an increasing focus on the negative consequences of digital technologies rather than their upside. And it's just been so refreshing being on this panel where there's so much enthusiasm and optimism. I, to throw something on, on top of that, I think one thing to consider just if really kind of thinking blue sky like this is that, you know, as we advance and as technology improves, I mean, to think very economisty about it, right, kind of the marginal utility of what we're gaining out of a lot of these innovations may not necessarily be very high compared to the marginal utility of indoor plumbing or electrification. And so the that that real tangible feel of improvement um, that say my grandmother and my parents felt as those kind of those things hit their households, may, you know there may be improvements you know coming along, but the new version of my iPhone doesn't have the same doesn't carry the same weight right of 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 oh my god we have electricity so you do wonder if that you know kind of a a notion of a little con you know, like well things are fine the way they are and I don't really like change. Uh, it, and, and the changes I'm looking at aren't that, they're, they're good, but they're not that great. It starts to weigh a little on people's willingness as you know, I think you know, uh, we were saying, people's willingness to, to, to kind of get behind it and, and accept the, the, the disruption that comes. Whereas maybe in the past, you maybe are a little more willing to accept some disruptions because the gains were just so tangible and big uh, and so clear. A lot of the innovations might also be negative. So it could be easier for terrorists to deploy weapons of mass destruction. Drone attacks might become a greater worry. Even something more mundane, such as crypto. Economists debate all the time, well, there's a trillion dollars of value created, but what's the social value there? I would just say that debate is unsettled, but a trillion dollars is a lot if the social value isn't going to be that high. So let's not fall into the trap of thinking all innovation is good that has for many decades typically been the case, but I think it's very easy to imagine a very near future where actually a lot of the innovation on net is bad. Indeed, that's that's sort of what I was getting at. The, too much of it seems to me a lot of the media coverage is is about is about these downsides, and I wonder if one of the reasons is in that when you uh, we seem to take it for granted that things are obviously better than they were 20 or 30 years ago, that people's lives are clearly better. But certainly there's a, a narrative out there that that is certainly not the case, that really people's lives really aren't much better over the past 30 or 40 years. And we've had all this disruption and job loss, mergers, acquisitions, we've had new technologies, but people's lives aren't any better. So so what's what's the point of all this? And I do worry about that, 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 that attitude continuing to feed uh, a certain narrative and that we won't do the things that we need to do to keep growth um, advancing the way I think we'd all like it to. Um, I think you're not taking the negative seriously enough. So if parts maybe. of the Rust Belt don't return, yes, that's terrible. But you could imagine just at the fundamental balance between technologies of attack and technologies of defense is so altered that the world as we know it isn't really quite feasible anymore. Like eventually that does happen, right? It's happened every other historical era. The new balance may or may not be a better one. Um, uh, Dietrich, uh, we've focused on Tyler's book. I know you ha you have a book too, uh, which is uh, that all these concerns I have about productivity growth 
but maybe I shouldn't be so concerned about them. They're actually a sign of, of what our society has done right. Yeah, I, you know, that book very much is a look backwards as opposed to a look forwards in many ways. So it's, you know, I don't want to extrapolate that argument necessarily, you know, blindly. But, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the point of that was that, and that gets back to an earlier comment I made, which is that the thinking about productivity growth or GDP growth in particular isn't necessarily the way to measure improvement, uh, you know, in quotes, you know, however you want to think about welfare or well-being. You know, we saw lots of, we saw very rapid economic growth in the 20th century tied to a lot of very material gains, um, putting things in homes, basically. Uh, and then through aging and through shifts out of producing stuff uh, and, and things, we, we kind of naturally got, got much slower growth as a result of being very good at it for a long time, right? So those are, the argument in the book is basically the, the reason we have some, some slower growth now is because we did a lot of things right uh, for a long time. And it just, you know, if you do start to project that forward, then, then that's where I say that, that disconnect between the kind of the statistics and the, the actual experience, I think will keep kind of, will certainly stay there and may accelerate in the sense that as we invent things, well, we, are, we often are, are, like I said, we, we may just be deciding we've invented a way to use less of stuff. And so GDP might not go up. Um, we might, might lower our resource use. We might see that in some productivity, but, but we may have reached the point where we're not trying to actively make the economy grow. We're trying to limit our impact on the environment or, uh, or something like that. And, and so it's, you know, I think, it makes it harder to evaluate, are we improving? You know, kind of to Tyler's point, like you can't just look at one statistic GDP per capita say and say, well, on net things must be getting better because that's going up a lot. We're gonna have to think hard about the, the particular implications of these technologies as they arise. What is, uh, what is sort of the consensus confidence level that, you know, uh, we probably focus less on AI than you know many. Uh, I think conferences like or panels like this would. But what what is our confidence level? These technologies won't create widespread unemployment, and they will create. They will help us do what we do better. They will create new things for us to do, and they're not just going to end up being job replacing uh, technologies. And as our and, and and as our confidence merely based on that's what's happened in the past. Uh, whoever wants to start, Catherine. Right, well, I'll take that. So, you know, we always devote half of our economics of AI conference to trying to do empirical studies of precisely this. And in some sense, given that, let's be clear, this is a recent change and economists love their long, long data sets. I will say that the, what, the evidence we have is scattered ac across multiple studies. But I think it's fair to say that those multiple studies do give a consistent view of machine learning as being a human augmenting technology rather than a displacement technology. And now if you wanted to argue back, you could say, well, maybe the places you looked where machine learning has been adopted, first of all, it has been adopted to enhance white collar workers productivity. And so you could make that argument, but I would say that at least if you look at the studies where machine learning has been adopted broadly and we've been able to measure something, it has been very much uh, augmenting productivity rather than there being any evidence of displacement. I'm not so worried about job loss. I, I'm more worried that the internet makes people weirder. Now that makes them more creative. It creates small groups who it's very fruitful. It can be fun, exciting. Uh, but just viewed anecdotally, it seems reasonably obvious to me the internet is making us weirder on the whole in a QAnon sort of way. And that intersects with a fairly large government. And I don't think we have any good models for how that process works, either on the psychological side or the political science governance side. So I'm broadly worried about that, but without having a clear prediction. It just seems to me the political equilibria we used to have are just not coming back. So I'm not I'm not worried about um, uh, automation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not worried about technological advances replacing human workers for the same reason I'm confident that 
uh, all of these technologies that are being created are going to eventually be be used to make the economy more productive, which is that it's just it's just too too much low hanging fruit for businesses to pass up. Um, it will, of course, be the case that uh, advances in technology uh, lead to some businesses and some industries uh, uh, using fewer workers. That's how product, that's what productivity is. Um, but that's going to create a, a bunch of, 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 of workers, a bunch of human resources, a bunch of uh, human capital that, that, that's just sitting around um, that businesses can use for new stuff. And they're going to figure out new ways to use those workers. The same, the same basic process uh, uh, drives the adoption of, of new technologies. Um, businesses can just make too much money with these new technologies to, to ignore them. But I am worried about the... Um, the transition, uh, the transition period between you know, when a new technology is invented and when it's adopted, um, and I think that uh, we've actually been been you know we we uh, in conversations like these we often think about um, these changes as kind of looming you know the looming threat of automation the looming. Uh, changes that new technologies are going to bring. In reality, technological uh, uh, advances in, in, in technology um, have been reshaping the labor market for, for decades. And we've seen new ways of, of producing manufactured goods, uh, new ways of doing clerical work, um, new ways uh, of uh, doing other really important economic activities completely change. Uh, relative to what they looked like in the 1970s, say, or, or the 1980s. Um, and we've seen huge changes in the distribution of employment across occupations, with much less employment uh, in middle skill, middle wage occupations um, than there used to be. And that has had enormous consequences uh, for our society, for politics, um, and, and for the economy. And I expect that 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 kind of process is going to continue as as businesses learn how to integrate um, uh, newer technology, and that is that is very disruptive, um, even even if it does not uh, spell the the end of human work. I'll, I'll add one thing on top of what Michael is saying, which is, and I completely agree, right? Like we've watched this for know, two centuries, right, happening as people move in between occupations and industries. Um, well, I'll just say that it's a good thing if we work less. Uh, so um, if, if we find technology. <laughs> That's a controversial statement. Yeah, I, yeah. And then it becomes, I think, you know, touching back on that, that comment on the, uh, the equity across these technologies, uh, you know, like Michael used the example of being able to access, say, cancer treatment. You know, the, the disruptions come because and are, are, very, are felt very heavily by the, a small group of people maybe who are, are put out of work. But kind of over the long run, we, we might imagine AI or machine learning or, or some of these technologies allowing, in general, all of us to do less work and four days a week, three days a week, Keynes is 15 hours a week, whatever that is. If it's equitably uh, kind of applied, then, then that, that represents a benefit. You know, kind of putting ourselves out of work is a good thing in that sense. Um, it, you know, and, but it depends, you know, kind of the speed and pace of that and how, and how tightly it hits it may change the attitude about it, right? It's hard to tell somebody, well, you guys lost your job today, but don't worry, 30 years from now, everybody will be working 10 hours a week. That, that's not going to fly. Um, but it will be interesting to see if we can, we, if we do take advantage of some of these technologies to kind of find a new equilibrium where we all kind of ramp down the actual effort that goes in. Um, and use that for, well, you know, well, we could sit around and have have panel discussions about uh, about how the world works and uh, and enjoy our time. Would would an acceleration we were talking that may not be obvious in the all the economic statistics, but shouldn't it be obvious in some statistics if we're going to see an acceleration in technological progress? Wouldn't it show up somewhere if not? Business investment numbers, uh, the you know the the stock market, interest rates. Would there be some sort of measurable economic impact, even if it's even if it's uh, only how maybe it's you know extending lifespans or replacing 
carbon emitting technologies with carbon not emitting technologies. Shouldn't it show up somewhere in the, in, in the numbers? This isn't going to be like a numbers free phenomenon, is it? Public health statistics. Uh, but I think there's one innovation in particular we haven't discussed yet, and it could be the most important one. And that's innovations to make raising children easier. So raising children is one of the great joys of life, but it's also one of the great burdens. And I see really quite a few wealthy countries depopulating. So if we don't have innovations to make raising children either easier or more fun or less costly, whatever, uh, we're in big trouble. So let's not only talk about per capita GDP, let's talk about the number of capitas. And that's possibly a crisis. I would say already a crisis, say for Italy, maybe Japan, South Korea. Well, and it, it, it plays into this whole question of the future of innovation in general, right? The, 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 the general mental model uh, most growth economists would use would say that, you know, that's the scale of the number of people kind of having new ideas that is going to be behind these waves of innovations and starting businesses. And if, if we stop having new people, uh, and we run down that, that kind of, we aren't growing that stock anymore, we may well run down the pace of innovation or, you know, the, a, a shrinking population or a stagnant population is, means that certain businesses aren't viable, right? Like uh, there's certain businesses that are out there that could start tomorrow that with a large enough market, you know, it would be worth doing this. But if the market's shrinking, just the absolute number of people, then, then there's a lot of ideas out there that aren't worth implementing. So I think, you know, I think uh, that may be a number to Jim's point, like what numbers are we looking at? That's kind of one of those weird ones, but, I, but I'd agree with that. I think fertility rates in some sense are maybe one way of kind of, not the one statistic, but a, but a way of looking at, are we, are we doing, are we really progressing, right? Or do people feel that optimistic about the future that they, and, and that capable of putting kids into that future that they in fact are, are willing to, to have large families? I, I completely agree that, um, that, that, that the fertility rate is an important driver of, of innovation. Uh, going back to my earlier comments on why I'm confident that eventually something like a malaria vaccine will show up in U.S. productivity statistics, though, though I agree with Tyler that that could take a couple, a couple decades uh, uh, to, um, to, to happen. I'm, I guess I'm less uh, convinced that the difficulty of having uh, of raising children or the burdens of raising children are driving uh, declines in fertility. Uh, you know, it was pretty tough to to raise children a hundred years ago. Maybe 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 even tougher than it was today. It was arguably tougher to raise children uh, two hundred years ago than than it was a hundred years ago. Uh, there is a vast infrastructure in many of these countries. Uh, that, 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 that witness declining fertility rates uh, to support people who are trying to trying to raise kids. Uh, so I'm not I'm not disagreeing that that declining fertility is a problem for innovation. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, arguing that it, it is it's not clear to me what is what is driving that decline. I want to, we have a we have really a lot of questions from people watching. So I want to ask sort of one final of my my questions. For we get to theirs. If we if we had this um, you know seminar ten years from now, and it and it's why why the great stagnation continued and there was no great acceleration, do you think it's more likely to be because the technologies that we've mentioned really didn't turn out to be that transformational, or do you think it's more likely to be we implemented policies that were actually harmful uh, to economic growth and productivity growth? Whoever wants to take a swing at that one. I have a different nomination. I would say it's that we had some emergencies, we responded pretty excellently, and then we sunk back into our sloth. Right. You know, I was uh, I was sort of thinking of a version of that, Tyler, in that, you know, something which has been an amazing shock uh, in terms of the adoption of digital technologies due to the pandemic has been the amazing the number of small businesses that now have online short storefronts. And let's be clear, this is a technology that's been available for 15 years, right? But it was only really the necessity, the need, which made it top of mind. And so, so much of our advances, you know, are they going to be top of mind in the next 10 years? If, especially in a world, I think where Tyler says, we might be getting distracted by, uh, you know, by, by, as you say, the other aspects of what might be the roaring 20s. 
Yeah, I wonder if it's, I hesitate, some of it is part of policy perhaps, but but maybe kind of to Tyler and Catherine's point, it's, it's, a, it's a willingness. I mean, I think there is this, you know, are we willing to take the risks that are associated with innovations and implementing them? Because they involve risks and disruptions and, and are the gains seen as worth it? And, and maybe, you know, kind of the, the vaccine situation in the EU is, is, is perhaps the tangible example of that, right? Like, are, will we be, this, right? The, this is where the situation where like, how could it be more clear what the benefits are of this new technology? And it's still fighting against this very risk averse um, kind of policy setting and mood so to speak, from the implementers. So, so I think, I, I think that's more of a cultural thing than it is necessarily a specific policy. Although in that vaccine case, some of that's you know really is written into their their evaluation. So I, I would lean that way. I think it's more likely to be that kind of thing than it is the actual failure of of these technologies to 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 arise or to be leveraged. It's it's probably more. Uh, fear of risk, uh, you know, uh, uh, precautionary principles kind of things that, that prevents people from, from, from putting them in. And to take Jim's question literally, um, if, if, the, if the technologies that we, that we see existing haven't, haven't found ways of being used uh, and aren't showing up in productivity statistics, but that seems to me to be not really an issue of, of public policy. Uh, my my worry about about uh, policy uh, poorly designed policy is that it prevents the emergence of new of new technologies that we're not doing enough to support research and development that we are unnecessarily holding back entrepreneurism and and unnecessarily holding back business investment in a way that's preventing new ways of, of doing things or new technologies from being invented um, we we can point to a bunch of new technologies that have been invented. And so if those are not incorporated into, into business practices and don't show up in productivity statistics, you know, then I think you have to look uh, at the demand side of the economy. This conversation has been, has been focused almost exclusively on the supply side, which is, which is the right place to, to, to put it. But um, if, if we fail to, to use batteries or we fail to use new vaccine uh, 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 creation technologies or things of this nature, you know, then, then that just suggests that, that people, people don't want it and businesses don't see um, a, a profitable way to use those. And, you know, this, this is, I think, a real threat to, um, to innovation and, and, and to productivity, uh, you know, if because of the aging of the population and lots of people saving and, you know, thing, you know big, powerful macroeconomic forces like this, we, we, we have uh, just less demand in the economy than, 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 than we need to have in order to, to spur um, businesses to, to, to do creative and inventive things, um, then, then that is a problem. And I would say, I, I, I would place that as, as a, you know, a, a, a non-trivial potential threat to, to further productivity growth. All right, let me uh, run through some of these uh, fantastic questions uh, from the viewers. All right, as science grows more complex and research productivity slows down, do we need to expand our supply of scientists and innovators? If so, what role does government have here? Well, so, yes. <laughs> Yes, the answer is yes. I mean, oh, we need to yeah. we need to we need to let in way more high skilled immigrants. We need to um, uh, give a green card to uh, any uh, uh, immigrant who graduates in a STEM field from a from a U.S. Uh, research university. We need to uh, uh, have much more government funding of scientific research. Uh, we need to uh, uh, you know, um, allow businesses to invest in research and development uh, more, more than they currently do. Uh, we need to have a culture that encourages uh, risk-taking and, and that encourages entrepreneurship. Um, all of these things, I think, are, are, are critical. 
I th- I'd add there's there's a lot of interesting research out in the, just the last few years about the pools of potential talent that we don't necessarily use um, within, well, within the U.S., within Europe, within any country, but uh, a lot of them are focused on the U.S., that uh, a lot of innovation comes from people who are part of small networks where they're exposed to innovators throughout their life. Uh, their parents were, they live in small neighborhoods and very small physical areas where they happen to be exposed to that environment and that, that we maybe aren't, we aren't using the full pool of that. So, and I, I don't know what the, the policy is that you would implement to rectify that, but I think it's, it's the kind of thing that it's there. It's, it's, it's not like we have to invent new people to do this R and D. They're out there, and there's a you know a, a tale of that that those groups that has the, the talent to do this stuff. We just need to do a better job of pulling them in. And by itself, it can just increase the number of people that are participating and and spitting out good ideas. Um, uh, as if, as we break out of the great stagnation, will Silicon Valley be leading the way, or will China take the lead in technological innovation? It's almost like an American century, China century uh, kind of question. I bet on America. I bet on America. Look at the vaccines, right? It's a big difference. We're even beating them in terms of vaccinating people. And furthermore, Chinese vaccines in China are being held up by their own manufacturing capacity, which runs counter to the traditional narrative. But I don't actually think it's a surprise. I think the Chinese are way ahead of us in terms of payment space and uh, QR codes and integration of finance and commerce. Those are some very real areas. Maybe they'll end up ahead of us with quantum computing or some biomedical areas. But the simple question, how many really smart immigrants want to go live in China, I think settles it. Um, Should we be concerned about government spending crowding out private investment trapping us in stagnation? No. <laughs> I mean, I would have, I would have said no a year ago. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that we are going to uh, reach full employment, um, and I think that the uh, Biden administration wants to continue doing big deficit finance spending programs beyond that point, and so there is going to be. Uh, uh, some crowding out happening, um, you know, that's, I think, I think, I think that's, that's more a risk uh, for macroeconomic stability, I think, than, than, than it is for any sort of medium term productivity concerns. Um, but, you know, having, having uh, uh, what I would describe as a more responsible um, macroeconomic policy, I think, is important, but but um, you know may not be a rabbit hole, Jim, that you that you want us to go down. Well, good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you an, even a better rabbit hole. Uh, I mean, you asked the question, so maybe you yeah, do. That, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to take control here. No, I know you don't. You're very giving. Uh, so, but this is a good rabbit hole question. How does religion impact the adoption of technology? In my view, religion on average keeps the birth rate higher. So on net, I think a higher population is good for innovation, uh, but it can check the contributions of female scientists or female innovators. I don't think we should forget that. Uh, Religion per se, other than its effects on population, it can build an ethos for a society or sense of cohesion. I think we're past the point where Religion is stifling innovation because of you know what the church tells people to believe, but I think it's a mixed effect, mostly positive. But with copy- have you ever heard of the printing press? I've heard of the printing press. That was an important. That was an important technology. <laughs> can I? Can I? Someone to dispute that. Feel free. Can I ask a question based on that question? Um, and can I? I want to ask it of, of Catherine because I just don't know this this area are there do we have research on on whether uh, digital participation we'll call it facebook whatever you want uh increases uh, religious identification decreases it does it do, do we have any sense and and that's for anybody really yeah. I thought Catherine might well might let me let me tell you about 
as ever, we tend to write papers at a time because we're such a new field. But let me give you an example of the paper. We, we look, you know, you look to see what happens when a state suggests that creationism can be part of the curriculum. And then what we what we found is that the internet exacerbates all the effects of that rule. In that, if you go to the right parts of the internet, there's it's very easy to find support for creationism. And the internet enables you to do that. And then you go down that rabbit hole, and then it affects your scoring on key statistics for getting into university. And so I sort of think there's interesting interactions between religion and digital tools, but it's not the case that we're sort of thinking that it's the bar or barrier that we might have three decades ago. I'm gonna ask one more question here. It's, uh, this was directed to uh, a Tyler, but uh, so I guess Tyler, please answer it and anyone else can then uh, jump in. What can policymakers do to make sure the balance of innovation remains positive. And I guess that could mean that it's the kind of innovation that creates jobs. It's the kind of innovation that makes our lives better, not just makes us uh, weirder or distracts us. So how can we make sure we get good innovation? I don't think that's a variable. We're very good at controlling. Another issue I'll bring up hasn't been mentioned yet, but innovation mm -hmm. in highly addictive drugs already mm -hmm. is a major problem, has been so for a while, possibly could become a bigger problem yet. If you're bullish on biomedical innovation, uh, we may also innovate with, with bad drugs that, that harm people's lives. So I've studied drug policy a bit, science policy, but I think the, the general configuration of where you are at already tends to overwhelm what you can do. I'm not saying we shouldn't do anything, but I think one should have actually a somewhat modest predictive opinion of how much uh, policymakers can indeed change these variables. Anybody else want to jump with an idea, or even to say, or even give me a, a final idea about if we want government policy to be sort of pro-innovation? We mentioned a little bit, I think, about immigration. Any other uh, sort of pro-innovation policies anyone wants to highlight to wrap up? I, I'll echo Michael's before. You know, he mentioned essentially basic science research. I don't think you said it quite that way, Michael, but but increased funding for basic science research. We, we know that that has maybe bad, maybe, you know, may have good outcomes, may have bad outcomes, depending on, because we can't forecast as, as necessarily as Tyler said, but, but, but we know that that forms the core, right? And trying to be super targeted, we're not good at that. So basic science research is and, and kind of letting in that sense, then let the market figure out what that basic science can do, potentially good or bad, and then you still have to be careful. But I think that's maybe one of the other big pieces here to, to ensure that innovation continues. All right, then I'd like to thank Tyler, Catherine, Dietrich, and Mike for uh, coming on the panel today. And thanks everybody for, uh, for watching. Thanks a lot.